a real cause for concern is the demographic change that we're going through. No democracy, to my knowledge, has undergone a transition in which an ethnic majority loses its majority status uh, and democracy survives. Hi, I'm Ian Bremmer, and welcome to the G Zero World Podcast. I'm host of the weekly show G Zero World on Facebook Watch. In this podcast, we share extended versions of the big interviews from that show. This week, I sit down with Dr. Stephen Levitsky, professor of government at Harvard University. He's known for his work on competitive authoritarian regimes and is an expert on Latin America. Today, I'll ask him about democracy in crisis, both in South America and in the United States. Let's get to it. The G Zero World is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, understands the value of surface, safety, and stability in today's uncertain world. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. Are democracies actually dying right now? They don't die as often as many people think, actually. Uh, the number of full democracies, uh, particularly established democracies, democracies that have been in place for, say, two decades that have died in the history of the world can be counted on one hand. And they are? Venezuela, Chile, Uruguay, so three in Latin America. And then democracies that were more short-lived, like Spain and, uh, and Germany in the 1930s. Um, Hungary, depending on, on your view of the situation, may be a, a, another case. Um, but there, the, the number of full-scale democracies that have died is, is relatively small. When you're identifying a potential threat to democracy, what are the ingredients that go into that? What are the, what are the indications that um, w we have problems? So there's no perfect test um, to identify an autocrat. But we draw heavily on Juan Linz, the, the Spanish political scientist, taught at Yale for many years. He um, was born in Weimar, Germany, grew up in uh, the Spanish Civil War in Franco, Spain, really spent much of his career trying to understand how and why democracies die. And he, in a book, a very uh, uh, widely cited book published in the 1970s, put together what he called a, a litmus test for, for identifying authoritarians. And we kind of take that and repackage it a little bit and try to present it a bit more clearly in our book. And that litmus test has four elements. This, so this draws on Linz. Um, one of them is calling into question democratic rules of the game. So, for example, uh, Trump's calling our elections rigged is, is a, and suggesting that he might not abide by the right— uh, Results of elections is an example of that. Two is threatening to suspend civil liberties of opponents or the media. Three is encouraging or condoning violence. Uh, and fourth is not accepting the legitimacy of your rival. So those are the four um, indicators that, that we use. And we argue in the book that during the 2016 campaign, Trump checked off all four boxes. He, he met all four indicators, and this is something— that no major party candidate in the United States did. So Trump has an authoritarian impulse, which is pretty strong and pretty consistent. On the other hand, um, Trump's ability to maintain focus and consistency on most things is fairly low. Yeah, and that helps us. The people around Trump, um, most of them are fairly establishment characters at this point, as opposed to, say, Steve Bannon or Mike Flynn in the early days. And the institutions are pretty strong. I mean, no deep state, but at least a deep bureaucracy. So if you, if you take those four check marks against Trump as individual and compare them with all of the sort of other side of the balance sheet, you come away uh, comforted, enthusiastic? Well, much less concerned than we would be in a country like Bolivia or Ecuador or Turkey or, or, or Nicaragua, where democratic institutions are very weak. If you put an authoritarian figure in a country with very weak democratic institutions, democratic institutions have little chance. If you put an authoritarian, somebody with authoritarian impulses, I think is a good way of describing Trump, in a, in a setting with a strong opposition and fairly robust institutions— yeah, those institutions have a, a fighting chance. I would say there's a very good chance that American institutions will will survive this. 
um, it's still worth worrying about. This is, it, it's again, unprecedented uh, in all of our lifetimes that we would elect a president with authoritarian impulses. Obviously, Nixon is a, is a partial example of what I just said, but nobody has got, nobody that we've elected in more than a century has got these sorts of uh, illiberal instincts. How worried do you think we should be about the state of liberal democracy in the world today? Well, our perspective is a little bit different. We do not think that fascism is around the corner. We don't think that the United States, that, 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 a, that a military coup or outright tyranny is imminent in the United States. But we, like I think most Americans, have long taken the stability of American democracy for granted. We kind of assume, we kind of operate under the assumption that no matter how recklessly our politicians behave, no matter how recklessly we behave, we can't possibly break our democracy. And we think that is a dangerous mistake. We, we don't think that American democracy is dead. We don't even think that it's dying. But we do think that there are warning signs. There are things that uh, should lead us to be concerned and, and careful in protecting our institutions. What are the institutions in the United States right now that you think are actually most vulnerable to eroding away from being effective democratic? Look, in terms of basic rights, when I think of uh, basic, dem el basic elements of democracy, one thinks of elections, one thinks of uh, uh, freedom of association, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. Those things are not under direct threat. I mean, even though Trump has uh, has verbally threatened the media, I think those those things are not under immediate threat. Um, but there is some cause for concern. I wouldn't five ten years ago if you'd, if you'd asked me whether uh, Americans would whether this sort of consensus behind core institutions like elections and uh, a free press was in danger of erosion, I would have said no. But um, one effect of Trump's rhetoric against elections, meaning not against elections, but questioning over and over again, both before and after the election, Rigged. whether our elections are free and fair, whether American elections are free and fair, and his calling into question the legitimacy of the independent or the main, so-called mainstream media, arguing over and over again that the media are conspiring to bring his government down, that's had an effect on public opinion to the point where a large number of Americans, and in some polls, a majority of Republicans, now believe that our elections are fraudulent, that do not believe that our elections are clean, and now believe that our media is conspiring against the government. You haven't mentioned one thing that a lot of people seem to believe is how the system is rigged, which is not that the elections are stolen, but that fundamentally the swamp, as it's called, kind of skews outcomes to favor a very small number of wealthy Americans and special interests. Yep, that's a great point. I'm not sure I would call it a swamp because a swamp kind of implies um, corruption and, and, and backroom deals, whereas actually this, the amazing thing about it in the United States is it's legal. The, it's all legal, yeah. and most of it is is above board. It's actually a pretty transparent swamp. I agree with you. It, um, this is not the argument. So there are many ways for a democracy to be enfeebled, to become dysfunctional, to become less democratic. Mm -hmm. And without question, the, the, oh, the extraordinary influence of money in politics in the United States is one such way. So what are the characteristics that make democracies most resilient, not just institutional, but generally. I'm, I'm, I'm an alien, I'm looking down at a planet, I wanna create, fertilize some democracies. What are the sorts of ingredients I want? The two factors that empirically matter the most in terms of predicting resilience and durability are age and wealth. And actually the United States scores pretty well on both. Um, certainly in terms of, it, of its constitutional system, not full democracy, but in terms of its constitutional system, one of the oldest on earth, and it's also one of the wealthiest democracies on earth. So um, those two sort of structural factors alone, age and, and wealth, predict quite a bit of resilience. And so age of the system, again, not age of the people. Um, yes, but the systems are not like people, right? People are more vulnerable to death as they get older. Democracies are more resilient as they get older. And wealth, distribution effects not as important? If you look at wealth and age alone, you sleep a while at night, you can be quite confident in the survival of, of U.S. democracy. Two things that make me less confident or that, 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 that worry me a fair amount are one, rising levels of income inequality. 
Um, we are now, by, by most measures, at higher levels of income inequality than any time since before the Depression. The Depression. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, the Gilded Age, basically. That yeah. is uh, a real cause for concern. Uh, and the other is the is the demographic change that we're that we're going through. No democracy, to my knowledge, has undergone a transition in which an ethnic majority loses its majority status uh, and democracy survives. So let me move uh, to a different part of the world and one that you know very well, which is Latin America, uh, and say, you know, Venezuela used to have real elections, and uh, they aren't anymore. Uh, are you surprised by that? And what happened? Yeah, Venezuela is one of the really few clear-cut cases of full-scale, consolidated democracy. Dying. Dying. Outright dying. Yeah. Um, it is gone today, right? It is gone. It, yeah. is, it, is, a, it is basically a dictatorship at this point. Um, it, it, it was a, a long, unhappy story that began with oil and very high expectations high levels of corruption, and a terrible economic crisis that endured really for for 20 years. Um, Standards of living declined, levels of inequality, levels of poverty skyrocketed between the late 1970s and the late 1990s. And so the the Venezuelans were living much worse, particularly poor Venezuelans, were much worse off in the late 1990s than they'd been in the 1970s. The 1970s, the country was experiencing an oil boom. Their president was telling them they were going to be first world nation, and they end up in poverty. Um, so the level of disgust towards politicians, the level of anger, which we see uh, a bit of in the United States, magnified tenfold in Venezuela, um, which led to a collapse of the party system. And it led Venezuelans to basically say, you know, screw it, let's take a wrecking ball to the elite. Now, another country right now in Latin America where you have a lot of disgust with established leaders across the board, elections coming up, most popular person that's running for those elections right now, Mr. Bolsonaro, uh, seems to check off some of the boxes that you've oh, talked yeah. about on the authoritarian side. If he actually goes ahead and wins, is, a, is Brazil another country you conceivably are worried about heading in this direction? Yeah. I mean, I'm. Um, there's a debate, as you know, uh, about whether the world has sort of sunk into a, a democratic recession and whether there's a great retreat or rollback of democracy in the world. I'm less pessimistic than a lot of people in, in that debate. I actually think that in spite of, of a number of geopolitical global challenges, the number of democracies in the world has remained pretty stable over the last decade. But the, the comparative importance of one particular non-democracy, China, has grown massively. Yes. And that may well have an impact in the, in the future. But uh, so the geopolitical balance, the balance of power in the world has changed. The, the strength, the influence, the, uh, uh, the prestige of the liberal West has declined, but that doesn't automatically translate. It's a challenge to existing democracies. It doesn't automatically mean democratic rollback. The three countries that I'm, that I'm really watching closely that I worry about are three big middle-income countries in three different regions. Brazil. India, Brazil, South Africa. Yeah. All three of them are still democracies. Um, all three of them have relatively robust democratic institutions, the real democracies that have, that have now stuck around for, for a while, for more than two decades, the, the youngest is South Africa. But uh, all three of them are potentially threatened. And if they go, for example, if Brazilian democracy falls apart, taking the route that you just described, a, a, a populist outsider, right-wing populist, Bolsonaro, m- much like Trump in many ways, getting elected. Brazilian democratic institutions are strong, but they're not as strong as the United States. Brazil is in the middle of a um, of a real perfect storm of a crisis, much much deeper than the United States. A severe economic crisis, plus what may be the biggest corruption scandal in the history of the democratic world. It's extraordinary, uh, yeah. which implicates the entire political elite, which gives people real reason, real reason to say to look at the entire political elite, all the established parties, and say to hell with them all and vote for a populist. So there there are real risks in Brazil. If Brazil's democracy were to fall apart. I would worry a lot about democracy in the rest of the region. If we look at the other two countries that you're talking about, you're worried about both India and South Africa, a lot of people have uh, a belief that those are countries heading in the right direction right now, that they're leaders that uh, people believe more in. Certainly in India. uh, And with Ramaphosa in South Africa as well, compared to certainly what you had. Um, Where where would you tell people to watch if there's a danger from those two countries that would come from what? 
going forward? I think the electoral hegemony of the ruling party. Uh, it's more obvious in South Africa, yes. where the ANC is a liberation party, much like India half a century ago, which because of its role in, in the, the um, struggle against apartheid and uh, given the demographics of the country, the ANC was bound for a good generation or so to be a dominant party, which is always a risk uh, in, in terms of authoritarianism. But thus far, the rule of law has um, and constitutionality has 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 prevailed um, to the great credit of the ANC and, and the the founding generation. But um, one one is hegemony. The other two things that are worth worrying about in South Africa: one, the level of violence, which leads to uh, sectors of society seeking out a strong hand, uh, and two, the slow pace of redistribution, um, which has led to demands and some efforts on the part of, of, of elements of the government and the, the ruling party for uh, a more accelerated land reform, which could lead to tensions, conflicts over property rights, which, I mean, I don't think that a sort of Zimbabwe-like path is particularly likely in South Africa, but it's, it's, it's something to watch. Um, in India, you have a, a, a new ruling party, but a, a, a real domino one. The Congress party is, is badly weakened, doesn't show a lot of signs of revitalization, and the BJP is a really strong party. Um, and it, it's, you know, as a, a, um, there are debates about sort of how nationalist the BJP still is, but in a country as uh, ethnically diverse and in some cases ethnically divided, as, as India, a, a strong sort of Hindu nationalism could trigger violence and could trigger, potentially at least, abuse of their civil liberties or human rights. We've talked a lot about what's happening inside countries. We haven't talked a lot about the supranational experiments. And of course, the biggest one in democracy is Europe. Yeah. And, and so I'm wondering, you know, a lot of people that oppose what's happening in Europe right now oppose it because they say, we've lost the ability to have democratic influence over our government. It's determined by these bureaucrats in Brussels who don't care about what it means to live in this system and big inequality and look what happened to Greece and the rest. Are there lessons for democracy in how Europe was put together and the challenges that they're now experiencing? If voters perceive that the decisions that are made above them and about them are completely disconnected from from their own preferences, they're going to get angry. And, and what's happened, and this is, I think, a parallel of the United States. With one, one, one thing that's happened all, throughout the advanced industrialized countries in the last 25 years or so is that center-right and center-left have converged on two main questions, on globalization, support for globalization, and tolerance of immigration. Um, I happen to think both those things are positive. In fact, a majority of Americans think both of those things are positive. I think the support is more uneven in, in Europe. But there is a chunk of the population in every advanced industrialized country, including the United States, maybe a third, maybe 40 percent. So it hasn't worked for them. Is unhappy with one or both of those things, does not like free trade and globalization, does not, not happy with immigration, and feels like nobody in the political elite, not center right, not center left, nobody in the political establishment represents their view. And I think the problem... I mean, so Trump's appeal, Trump's breaking with the consensus on both of those issues got him a lot of attention. It's not the only thing that won him support, but it, um, but it, was, it was a refreshing alternative for many voters. In Europe, it's the, the problem is made even worse by this added EU layer, right? So it's not only that the center left and center right in each European country has kind of abandoned the voter, but it seems like even those parties have given up authority to this to Brussels. Mm -hmm. And what's the lesson? Um, if, if governments are not perceived to be responsive to voters, um, political elites are going to be in trouble. Steve Levitsky, Harvard University professor, author of How Democracies Die. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. That's our show this week. 
We're gonna be coming back in a couple of weeks, making some changes, big announcements coming your way. One I'll tell you right now is we're gonna be switching the show to Monday morning. In the interim, we're gonna be putting out some of our greatest hits over the past weeks. Maggie Haberman, Preet Bharara, uh, Carl Bilt, you name it, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, if you wanna to subscribe to our channel on YouTube or watch us on Facebook, you're very welcome to do that. And we'll be coming back real soon. The G-Zero World is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, understands the value of surface, safety, and stability in today's uncertain world. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. You're listening to the G-Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast, your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in-depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of G-Zero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, G-Zero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.